Welcome to the part 20 of this video series. We are looking at AWS Solution Architect Associate real certification questions. In this part, we will cover questions linked with these three topics. Please focus on the concepts, hit the subscribe and the like button. Let's jump into the question. You have an application. It is deployed on multiple EC2 instances. There is a load balancer in between and these are your users. The users will always go via load balancer and the load balancer will decide which EC2 instances the load should be transferred to. So the problem here is you need exclusive access only from a single nation. For example, USA, a country which thinks that they are the boss of all the nations, USA, example. So out of these four con four options, <laughs> which one to select? Always remember, whenever you see that you have to give territorial access, always think of WAF, that is a solution. We never do a territorial access via security groups. So these two options are wrong. Neither we use network ACLs. If you want to block certain range of IPs, then you can use security groups. You want to block a whole set of nation, then you use WAF with a load balancer. Where do you place WAF? You place WAF before the load balancer, okay? So that way, even the request doesn't even enter the ALBP. Forget about entering EC2. So you have to protect these applications here. So you have to provide a security point here. Like in your apartment complex, you have a security point at the gate, not just close to your building. It's at the gate first, at the first checkpoint. Similarly, for any country, the first checkpoint is at the border, not at the capital of the country. The border is the security checkpoint, the first security checkpoint. Now you might ask, what the hell is WAF? Why do you put it on ALB? See, WAF, it helps you protect from common web exploits. What can be the exploits? For example, bots. You can put bots so that the availability of the application, the security of the application gets compromised. That's why many times you will see people are asking for extra piece of you know, information while logging in. They give you a code which is displayed so that bots cannot read it. The code will be in italic or some different fonts so to confuse the bots so that they want to understand if the human being is logging in. Okay. And the other thing it does is it creates so many instances or so many uh, uh, requests that your instances, EC2 instances will fail or whatever uh, your applications are, it will fail because it will utilize all the resources. The important piece, the important piece, the important piece here is how the traffic reaches your applications. That is, what is the path from year to year? What is the path, how it reaches the applications? That is what you can control. Needless to say, it will help you with SQL injection, cross-site scripting. It will prevent all of those. Where you can deploy WAF, you can deploy WAF on your CloudFront CDN solution on ALB, like in this question. We are deploying WAF on ALB, on ALB. So this is how it works. WAF is kind of a protection layer before it even tries to hit ALB or CloudFront or API gateways or AppSync. Okay, and then you can create subsequent policies, block and filters, monitoring using AWS Watch, CloudWatch, and etc. This is an excellent documentation which tells you how WAF needs to be used to filter incoming traffic from embarked countries. Some embarked countries can be somewhere from where the most hacking happens and so on. But in this question, they are not worried about embarked countries. They just want access from a single nation. This is my answer. We lock it and move forward. Let's see the next question three characters, three characters in this question. What are those three characters? Your user, I am, and Lambda functions. Okay, so it's for the users, or we say engineers, these are your engineering teams. For them to access Lambda for any purpose, you want to provide them access, and that access has to happen through I am, simple question, four options. The first one is wrong because, you know, you are trying to create a role and then you will provide, allow both engineering team and Lambda functions, assume that role. No, you just have to give a role to your engineering team, not to the Lambda function. So A is wrong. B is wrong because it talks about giving full access. This is crossly wrong because full access does not 
convey or obey the principle of least privilege this principle of least privilege has to be adhered to so full access does not adhere to that full access means they can run havoc i mean they can delete something they can uh, use it read it write it anything so that is not the requirement here c c talks about you create an execution role for lambda functions that is fine but then whom do you give these roles? It is it is an incomplete option. Who do you give these roles? Do you give it to your engineering team? Do you give it to the Lambda functions? What do you do with that? So C is wrong. That leaves us just with one option. That is option D. This looks correct. Why? Because what we will do is we will create an IAM role and we will allow the engineering team to assume that role. Okay. So we will create an IAM role here and we will tell this engineering team to assume this role so that they can access the Lambda functions. I hope my explanation is clear. This is my final answer. Let's look at the next question. This question is not so long, but the answers options, you have to understand it clearly. Okay. When you see such stuff in the exam, don't get confused. Usually these questions are easier to answer compared to other questions. You have a database Oracle on premises. You want to move it to Postgres on the AWS world. If you see these options, you'll get to know that they are talking about two stuff, one time and incremental. So like the before example I showed, you are moving from one house to the other. You will first do a one time move. You will, you, both the strategies will be different. For one time move, you will take higher uh, movers and packers and move all the luggage. After that, whatever is incremental, like coming through courier or some subsidy or secondary stuff that was there, you would maybe take your car and put it in your dicky and do it one at a time maybe. So there are two different strategies to move. Okay, there are two different strategies. The strategy is different for one time because you are going to take a movers and packers and the strategy is different for incremental because you will take your own car, put the stuff in your boot and transfer it. Now let's look at the options. It says to use data sync for one time initial migration. And then it says to use DMS for the change capture. It's reverse. You should use DMS for the one time move because DMS is just like your movers and packers they will come it's always born for that purpose that you put all the stuff and move it DMS is that data sync is always incremental if you remember question 75 this we were giving a continuous data transfer because this was an ongoing solution not an initial solution not a one time solution so we chose data sync keeping that in mind a is wrong let's look at b b also is wrong because i would not even dig further it says the same crap that use data sync for initial migration use dms for full load for change data capture this is also wrong i would not even go inside now c and d the option has these two options the answer has to be one of these two using schema conversion tool which with dms this is perfect for one time move which is perfect both options C and D are correct in this sense. Both the first option or the first part is correct. The second part deviates. The second part says where it deviates is it will do it for all the tables here and it will just do it for largest tables. We want to move all the tables, not just the largest tables. Okay, this is wrong because where in this question they have mentioned that you only have to do largest tables. No, nowhere. See, it clearly says the data must be maintained in sync across both databases. That means all tables, not just the large tables. And hence, D is wrong and C is my answer. But let's look at what the hell is AWS DMS. DMS, a good service which is designed for moving your migration or migrating your databases to AWS with minimal downtime. In the real world, when people try to move from on-prem to cloud, they want least downtime or no downtime, no downtime. That means the databases which are being used by applications, for example, Amazon.com is using a database and you're doing a migration of the database. There should be no interruption in the service. Amazon.com should work and available for all the users. There should be no interruption or hardly any interruption. And the beauty is DMS does it very quickly and securely. That is one. And the source data remains fully operational during migration. It minimizes the downtime to the applications. That's perfect. And to align with our question, we also have support for Oracle. That is awesome. So this would be my answer here.
please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button it takes a lot of effort to put in these contents a subscription and a like will help me keep myself motivated to put in some more contents if you are over motivated press the thanks button all the amount that you press in the thanks button will go in to prepare many such more informative contents which will help you clear the certifications there is no obligation i will continue to support even if there is no donation there this brings us to the end of part 20 please refer the previous parts parts 1 to 19 as well for previous questions there is an old playlist which is still valid it has hundreds of questions please refer that as well see you in the next part